Hi, this is Dr. Christopher Perrin with another episode of The Christopher Perrin Show, a podcast episode that's a part of the truenorth.fm podcast network. You can also find me at christopherperrin.substack.com, where I usually write about the same topics that I address here on this podcast. Today, I'd like to talk about friendship. Friendship is something that we really can't live without. Friendship is at the essence of what it also means to be an educated person or to know ourselves or to know really anything. In fact, this is what C.S. Lewis says in his book, The Four Loves. He says that we're born helpless, aren't we? We're born helpless, and then when we become fully aware or conscious, we, we realize that we're lonely, and we realize that we are in need physically, emotionally, and intellectually. We become aware of our need for others to know anything, even to know ourselves. That's Lewis. And Aristotle, he says, without friendship, no one would want to live, even if he had all goods. And if we had wealth, health, the material possessions that we need, but no friends, would life really be meaningful and joyful? And then many others have said similar things. Uh, th- this is Cicero, and he says, is not prosperity robbed of half its value if you have no one to share your joy? So imagine having kind of everything that you would want, but no one to talk to about it, no one to share it with. So friendship is central to just being human. You know, when a a baby is born, we know that the first thing that happens is that baby is placed on the breast of its mother and the baby and the mother gaze at one another and look into one another's faces and the mother beholding this new being that came from her but is not her. And how mysterious and wonderful it is to be greeted by your own child. Chesterton says somewhere that, you know, to be born into this world is, is, is kind of like a fairy tale. You, you didn't choose to be born, but here you are. And he says, your parents appear before you like brigands from behind a bush. <laughs> Every face that you encounter is like a face out of a fairy tale. Who is that person? What is that person's story? I wonder if we might intersect and have a friendship. What would I learn from this person? So I think Lewis is right. We know virtually anything and ourselves through others, and it begins at birth when we gaze into our mother's face. Well, Aristotle, to go back to him, in his Nicomachean Ethics, he has a chapter on friendship, a short chapter, very famous and very thoughtful, in which he just describes some things that are true to our humanity. So these things he describes about friendship don't really belong to Aristotle because he just was able to discern something that was true about all of us. And so what I'm gonna share with you from Aristotle belongs to you and to me and to all humanity. He just observed something that we all have observed. And that is that there are essentially three kinds of friends. There is the friend who is useful to us. And friends are useful, aren't they? Aren't you glad that you have certain kinds of friends for what they can do for you? In fact, we know, you know, you hear about this, but you know, one reason that some people want to get into an elite college, if you think about it, is not just because of the quality of the instruction, because that might not actually be that great. Maybe it's not actually the chief selling point But you know, if you get into Harvard, what you're getting into is a network, a network of people who can help you in the years to come. Because usually those people who go to those kinds of universities have families and friends already who are well-placed. Now, should that be our chief motive? But nonetheless, it underlies something. We enjoy friends because of what they can provide to us. 
Now, this can become something that's kind of selfish too, right? For example, I have a friend who has a pickup truck. Everybody should have a friend who has a pickup truck. If you don't have a pickup truck yourself, well, find a friend who does. Because about once every six months, you really would like to be able to use a pickup truck. That might be a kind of mundane example, but let's go to the academy. Let's say that you're a student studying geometry and you're finding it a little bit difficult and you find yourself next to a student who knows it really well. And not only does she know it, but she appears to love it. She's studying geometry even outside of class just for fun. And beyond that, she can clearly describe the axioms and the postulates and how the proofs and theorems work. She would be glad to sit next to you and reteach the lesson and draw sketches and diagrams for you. And you find yourself learning from her easily. And you're delighted to have her as a friend because she helps you to learn geometry. Now, when you're next to somebody in, say, class or work or in, other, in any other profession or vocation, and you find that person to be, well, just plain better than you at a particular skill, how do you respond? Because you have a choice, just like the geometry student could respond with envy to the girl who's smarter and better and more, more skilled at geometry and even good at teaching it, you could become envious and actually, well, separate yourself from her and smolder with some resentment. And you would not be learning more geometry and you wouldn't be enjoying a friendship with her. Well, this writer, A.G. Sertelange, for those of you listening, I'm holding up a book called The Intellectual Life, Its Spirit, Conditions, and Methods. He says there's only one proper attitude for us to have when we find ourselves in the presence of someone who is superior to us in a particular skill or virtue. And that attitude is gratitude because her gift or his gift is our gift. This is why students should be able to be grateful and to rejoice if there is a bright geometry student in the geometry class who can, as a friend and classmate, well, encourage and help everyone else. Her gift is your gift. Wouldn't you like to have a friend like that who's good at geometry, as well as a friend who has a pickup truck? Well, you can extend this to other areas and other goods, but friends, Aristotle says, are useful to us. There's a kind of utility. Now, we can use them selfishly such that, well, Greg is my friend who has a pickup truck, and he's my friend as long as he has a pickup truck. But once he sells it and gets a four-door sedan, he's no longer my friend because I have a four-door sedan, after all. So yes, of course, we can use people improperly, but they can benefit and bless us. And this happens all the time. So he's right, Aristotle's right, friends can help us. But he says there's a second level of friendship, and that level is the pleasant or pleasing friend. These are the friends who you just enjoy being around because maybe they delight you or cheer you, amuse you, or entertain you. It might be the person who is witty and funny, the person who's a great storyteller, the person who can, you know, make, uh, can speak in all kinds of different accents and, and, and affect the teacher and imitate the teacher in ways that are funny and delightful and so forth. Uh, there's lots of ways that people can be pleasing to you. Maybe it's just somebody whose face you really enjoy. Maybe somebody who's, has a beautiful countenance and you like being in their presence simply because of the beauty that they've been blessed with. Well, those are pleasant friends, friends who please us. Is there anything wrong with this? No. Can it become something that is wrong? Yes, because we always have a choice in how we respond to other human beings. But Aristotle goes on to say that there is a third 
level of friendship. And by the way, this is in book eight of the Nicomachean Ethics. And he says, this is the kind of friend that will make you better, help you to be a better person, that the virtues that this person possesses will in some ways rub off on you, inspire you, and call you to embody those same virtues yourself. This is the kind of friend that we would all like. And Cicero, uh, following in this tradition, he says it's been given to us, friendship has been given to us by nature, not to favor vice, but to aid virtue. One of the best things that can happen to you is to meet a friend who possesses such virtue that it makes you want to be the same. Do you have a friend like that? Someone who just makes you want to be, well, good? Wouldn't you like for that kind of a person to transfer into your geometry class? Not just somebody who's good at geometry, but somebody who is more morally good and spiritually holy. That is an example to you that just prompts you in your affections and in your, your heart to want to follow. This is the highest form of friendship. And Aristotle goes on to say that if you have a friend like this, this person will subsume those first two levels of friendship with him or her. In other words, a friend who is a virtuous friend will also be useful to you. A friend who inspires you to be better, to be virtuous, will also be pleasing to you. So what kind of friends would you really like to have? A virtuous friend. Now, we see these insights of Aristotle being being repeated in other places and other authors. We, we can read in Proverbs, for example, that, you know, one man sharpens another as iron sharpens iron. That the sparks can fly in a friendship, but sharpen us and make us better. Uh, we read, for example, that no greater love, this is Christ speaking in John 13, no, no greater love has any man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. This is virtue indeed, that you would be willing to go so far as to lay down your very life because of a love for another person. Aristotle says that friendship is like one soul in two bodies. He says it's like uh, having a second self to have a close friend. So as we look at the life of Christ, we see that he had 12 disciples, but of those 12, there were three that were particular close to him, Peter, James, and John. So, well, how many of these kinds of friends can you really have? This leads us to just another insight that humans have discovered about friendship. And that is, because we live in space and time and we have bodies, we're only capable of having so many friends, interacting with so many human beings. And so, this is why men and women don't have 38 children, can't have 38 children. Uh, this is why the clan, the size of a clan, is about 100 to 150. And this is about how many people you can keep track of. About 100 to 150 you can know, you can know their names, know something about them that we might call these kinds of friends acquaintances. They're not deep friends, but of those, say, 100 and 150, how many can be close friends? Maybe 10 to 12, like the disciples of Christ? But even of those 10 to 12, how many will really be your bosom buddies? Perhaps two or three? Even to have one deep friendship is to immeasurably bless our human life. I'd like to close with just this thought. Education really can't happen without meaningful friendship. Even the relationship from, of teacher to student is one of an appropriate kind of friendship where the teacher loves the student. 
where the teacher loves those things that are lovely, where the teacher loves the divine, loves the God who is love and is the author of all things that are lovely, all things that are true, all things that are good and beautiful, and is leading the student to see and love those same things. Augustine describes this as a relationship of sympathy and fellowship in which the teacher and the student in a proper sense, in a love relationship, loving the things that are lovely, spur one another on such that the teacher even sees replicated in the student his own love mirrored back to him as that student begins to love something true, good, and beautiful that he's been trying to teach his student. The teacher is taught by the student. It's a virtuous cycle. It's, it's a great passage, and you can read about that in his uh, instruction to catechumens, um, um, Augustine's work. So isn't that remarkable? Friendship describes the relationship of teacher and student. In one sense, we could say a teacher is just a more mature student filled with the Latin studium or studiositas, which means eagerness or zeal for, for knowledge. And what is a student? but just an immature teacher because as soon as the student comes to know something true, good, and beautiful, what does that student want to do but to share it with another friend? The good things that we possess, we naturally want to share with our friends. So yes, education is rooted in friendship, mentor to student in a relationship of love. And don't we long for this? Do you? Have you had a professor or a teacher in your past who has been that kind of friend? When your teacher becomes something like a colleague, someone who walks with you, someone who, as you seek truth together, becomes a friend. This inspires me. I hope it inspires you. We should think about education from this perspective as well. It's an education in friendship, and among friends. Well, thanks for listening or viewing. Once again, this is Christopher Perrin with The Christopher Perrin Show. You can watch some of my other uh, teaching and presentations on classicalu.com, and you can find some of my articles and writing on at christopherperrin.substack.com. Thanks again for being with me.